Hi everyone, this is Victor here. Right before making this video, Michael Burry, the hedge fund manager who predicted the 2008 financial crisis and who bet against the US housing market, said that the current downturn could be worse than the 2008 financial crisis. He wrote this tweet before deleting it. Today I wonder aloud if this could be worse than 2008, what interest rates are doing, exchange rates globally, central banks seem reactionary in CYA mode. Burry was likely referring to the Federal Reserve and other central banks frantically rates to curb stubborn inflation. The Fed's aggressive hikes combined with overseas headwinds such as the Russia-Ukraine war and the continued lockdowns in China have driven the US dollar to record highs against other world currencies such as the British pound. So in this video, I'm going to talk about will the US stock market bottom and recover soon. I will talk about these topics in this video. First, when will the US Fed stop raising interest rates? Second, when will the US stock market bottom and start recovering? Third, how to invest with a good margin of safety? And fourth, what is my investing strategy going forward? If you like this video, make sure to hit the like button, subscribe, and turn on the notification button. I will continue to make many excellent investing videos every week that will help you become a great investor. Also, if you like this channel and want to support it, check out my Patreon blog in the video description and become a premium member. Our goal is to create the best intelligent investor community that will help all our members grow their stock portfolios to over 7 figures over time. With your support, we'll be able to stay independent and create many excellent stock reviews and investing videos every week that will help you become a great investor. The link is in the video description. Take a look, let's start. So when will the US Fed stop raising interest rates? Before I answer this question, I want to give you more context first. At the time of making this video, the entire US stock market is in a large bear market. All the major US indexes are near the two-year low. For example, the S&P 500 is down more than 22% from its most recent peak, and the Nasdaq is down more than 32% from its most recent peak. As you may already know, high inflation and the US Fed's aggressive interest rate increases are the two biggest reasons that have crushed the US stock market. According to the latest data, the PCE inflation was 6.2% in August. Excluding the volatile food and energy prices, the PCE inflation rate was 4.9% in August. Now, both PCE inflation rates are still way too high above the US Fed's 2% target inflation rate. This means the US Fed will continue to raise interest rates and maintain very restrictive policies for some time until the US inflation is back to the 2% target. Even if it will increase the US dollar value even more compared to other foreign currencies and cause a hard landing recession in the US and many countries around the world. Jerome Powell said this at the recent Jackson Hole conference. We are moving our policy stance purposefully to a level that will be sufficiently restrictive to return turn inflation to 2%. Restoring price stability will likely require maintaining a restrictive policy stance for some time. The historical record cautions strongly against prematurely loosening policy. Of course, inflation has just about everyone's attention right now, which highlights a particular risk today. The longer the current bout of high inflation continues, the greater the chance that expectations of higher inflation will become entrenched. And that brings me to the third lesson, which is that we must keep at it until the job is done. History shows that the employment costs of bringing down inflation are likely, likely to increase with delay as high inflation becomes more entrenched in wage and price setting. The successful Volcker disinflation of the early 1980s followed multiple failed attempts to lower inflation over the previous 15 years. A lengthy period of very restrictive monetary policy was ultimately needed to stem high inflation and to start the process of getting inflation down to the low and stable levels that were the norm until the spring of last year. Our aim is to avoid that outcome by acting with resolve now. These lessons are guiding us as we use our tools to bring inflation down. We are taking forceful and rapid steps to moderate demand so that it comes into better alignment with supply and to keep inflation expectations anchored. We will keep at it until we're confident the job is done. Before making this video, the US Fed raised its Fed funds rate to another 75 bips. This brings the current Fed funds rate to between 3% and 3.25%. The US Fed is expected to keep raising interest rates between now and 2023. Here's the part that shows when the US Fed will likely stop raising interest rates. According to the FOMC's latest economic projection here, the US Fed is expected to raise its Fed funds rate to around 4.4% by the end of 2022 and around 4.6% in 2023. The 4.6% is the terminal rate, which is the peak of the expected US Fed funds rate in 2023. If you look at this here, the US Fed is expected to start lowering interest rates starting in 2024 and continue to lower interest rates throughout 2025 and afterward. The longer run Fed funds rate is expected to be around 2.5%. 
during this period, the U.S. Fed expects that the PC inflation will be around 5.4% by the end of 2022, 2.8% by the end of 2023, 2.3% by the end of 2024, and 2% by the end of 2025. This is from Bloomberg. Almost two-thirds of members now see rates peaking next year even higher than the 4.5% markets have pricing. Bloomberg Economics expects the terminal weight ultimately will be 5%. In my opinion, I believe the terminal rates or the peak of the US Fed funds rates will need to be higher at around 5.25%, which is similar to the terminal rates right before the 2008 financial crisis. I believe the US Fed's projected 4.6% terminal rates in 2023 is too optimistic. In the past several months, the US Fed's inflation projection have been too soft and too optimistic. Based on what I know, inflation seems to be more entrenched in the US, and it's not decreasing as fast as what the US Fed had hoped for. This is why the US Fed is raising interest rates quickly now, even if it will cause a hard landing recession in the US and many countries. The US Fed will not pull back interest rates prematurely now because they do not want to make the same policy mistake as in the 1970s when the US Fed lowered the Fed funds rate too early. Then the US Fed had to raise the Fed funds rate to as much as 19% to fight inflation in the early 1980s. The US CPI inflation was as high as 14% in 1980. It was known as the Great Inflation. The US Fed Vice Chair Neil Brenner said this recently. It will take time for the full effect of tighter financial conditions to work through different sectors and to bring inflation down. Monetary policy will need to be restricted for some time to have confidence that inflation is moving back to target. For these reasons, we are committed to avoiding pulling back prematurely. Another thing I should mention is this. I believe this will cause the global economy to head into a recession. The US Fed's aggressive interest rate hikes make the US dollar much stronger than other foreign currencies. The Wall Street Journal Dollar Index, which measures the dollar against a basket of other currencies, is up roughly 16% so far this year. A very strong US dollar helps the US to fight inflation and makes imports of goods and services much cheaper in the US, but it will cause many countries around the world, especially developing countries, to head into recessions. This is because the US dollar is the world's most important reserve currency. Most international trades and foreign debts are settled in US dollars. A very strong US dollar makes it much more expensive for other countries to import goods and services, import food and commodities, and pay off foreign debt star in US dollars. All all these things translate to higher inflation for other countries because their import costs are much higher. Also, a very strong US dollar forces other central banks around the world to raise interest rates quickly to fight inflation. Otherwise, if they don't raise their interest rates quickly, their currency such as the British pound will depreciate a lot against the US dollar. If you're an investor, you want to know when will the S&P 500 and Nasdaq bottom and start recovering. At the time of making this video, I don't think the S&P 500 and Nasdaq have bottom yet. This is because the US Fed will continue to raise interest rates in the upcoming months until sometime in 2023, when the US Fed funds rate is expected to reach its peak. If I have to make an educated prediction, I believe the US stock market will reach the bottom and start recovering sometime in 2023 when the US Fed's fund rate is near the peak or the terminal rate. The terminal rate is expected to be 4.6% in 2023 or higher if inflation continues to be high. Generally speaking, when the US Fed stops raising interest rates, the market tends to stabilize much more. And when the US Fed starts lowering interest rates, the market tends to recover much faster. The US Fed expects to decrease interest rates starting in 2024 and throughout 2025. The US Fed expects inflation will return to 2% by the end of 2025. If inflation continues to be high and more entrenched in the upcoming months, the US Fed will need to increase the Fed's funds rate to above 4.6% in 2023 and take longer to bring inflation back down to 2%. So why is it important to invest with a margin of safety, especially in this market? In this large bear market, it's very hard to time the market to find the market bottom. I don't think anyone can predict the market bottom accurately. So I think a much better investing strategy is to always invest with a good margin of safety, especially when the market will likely drop more going forward because of the US Fed's aggressive rate hikes. Investing with a good margin of safety means that you will only buy a stock when it is traded at price. Thus well below its interest value, so we will have a good margin of safety to reduce your investment risk while increasing your potential return if you are right about the investment. This from Investopedia. Margin of safety is the principle of buying security at significantly discount to its interest value, which is thought to not only provide high return opportunities, but also to minimize the downside risk of an investment. In simple terms, Benjamin Graham's goal was to buy assets worth $1 for 50 cents. He did this very, very well. 
Generally speaking, you will want a larger margin of safety for stocks and investments that have higher risk. I will give you one example here. I always use this intrinsic value calculator to calculate each company's intrinsic value. So I will know when the stock becomes undervalued, fairly value, or overvalued. If you want this calculator, you can download it in my Patreon blog in the video description. Personally, I want to take advantage of this large bear market by buying more Apple shares only when it's substantially undervalued. I want a margin of safety of 10% or more before I will buy more Apple shares. The first step is to understand the company well. Before you can calculate a stock's intrinsic value, you will need to study the company's fundamentals. You will need to understand its products and services, its financials, its long-term prospects, its management, its competitive advantage, and its competition and risks. Here's how you can calculate Apple's intrinsic value. These are the key assumptions in this calculator. First, I define Apple's intrinsic value as its future free cash flows discounted to the present day. The discount rate is 10%. You can use a higher discount rate here if you want to be more concerned. Apple's trailing 12 months of free cash flow is 108 billion. Based on my understanding of Apple's long term prospects and its fundamentals, I believe Apple's free cash flow will grow at a compound annual growth rate CAGR between 5% and 10% over the next five years. This free cash flow rate is lower than the past five years' growth rate. We'll go for these three case scenarios here worst case, normal case, and best case scenarios. Under the worst case scenario, we're using a compound annual growth rate CAGR of 5% over the next five years. If we forecast Apple's free cash flow over the next five years and discount the free cash flow to the present day, Apple's intrinsic value should be around $2 trillion for the entire company or $125 per share. I'm giving this scenario a 25% probability here. Under the normal case scenario, we're using a compound annual growth rate CAGR of 7.5% over the next five years. Apple's intrinsic value should be around $2.25 trillion for the entire company or $138 per share. I'm given this scenario a 50% probability here. Under the best case scenario, we're using compound annual growth rate CAGR of 10% over the next five years. Apple's intrinsic value should be around 2.5 trillion for the entire company, or $154 per share. I'm giving this scenario a 25% probability here. If we add all these numbers here, Apple's intrinsic value should be around $139 per share. In comparison, Morningstar estimated Apple's intrinsic value to be lower at $130 per share. This means I believe Apple is slightly overvalued at the time of making this video. Personally, I want to buy more Apple shares if it's at $125 per share or at least 10% below the intrinsic value here. So there will be a good margin of safety to reduce risk and increase the potential return. So what is my investing strategy going forward? I want to give you an update about one of my stock portfolios here. I also have other portfolios with the same stocks and the same strategy. So I'll use this one as an example. In the past few weeks before the recent US Fed rate increase, I made a very tough decision to sell hyper growth stocks such as Coinbase, Copan, Roblox, C Limited, Shopify, and Block because I know there will be more interest rate hikes between now and 2023. These hyper growth stocks will perform very well when inflation is low and when interest rates are near zero. But inflation is very high now and interest rates are expected to increase more between now and 2023. More importantly, most of these hyper growth stocks are still losing money every quarter. Their businesses are always impacted the most when inflation is high and when interest rates are high. Their cost of capital will continue to increase as interest rates increase. This means their stock valuations will decrease more whenever the US Fed increases the Fed funds rate. I decided to sell them, take the loss, and reinvest the money in better opportunities. The realized loss is around 28000 from selling these hyper gold stocks. In recent weeks, I sold my remaining Nvidia shares and had a small realized gain. The main reason is that the entire semiconductor industry is heading to a downturn because of much lower PC sales and lower PC demand, which will impact Nvidia's GPU sales for consumers. Also, there is still an excess supply of GPUs in the market now after cryptocurrencies crashed. This will impact Nvidia's earnings in the short term until there is no more excess GPU inventory in the market. I still like Nvidia's long-term prospects in the GPU market, so I will buy back Nvidia shares later on when the stock is lower. The total net realized gain was much higher before. Now it's much lower because I decided to cut the losses in the hyper gold stocks instead of waiting for them to recover. This is what I learned in the past two years. If the risk is too high, I believe it's much better to cut the losses a lot earlier and learn from the mistakes instead of waiting for the entire market to recover. Recently, when the Nasdaq reached a two-year low, I started a new position in the Nasdaq 100 ETF because I believe many US stocks are underwhelmed now. 
Also, I like many of the top holdings in the Nasdaq 100 ETF, such as Apple, Microsoft, Alphabet, Tesla, Amazon, Nvidia, Costco, and Adobe. Normally, I like to invest in these stocks individually, but I realized it would be more cost efficient if I invest in the Nasdaq 100 ETF instead. I said this earlier, I don't think the market has bottomed yet. I believe the market will likely bottom sometime in 2023 and start recovering when the US Fed's funds rate is near the terminal rate. Again, I cannot time the market bottom, so I'm using dollar cost averaging to invest in the Nasdaq 100 ETF for the long term. Personally, I will still stay away from all the hyper growth stocks that are not profitable yet, even if they're substantially undervalued. Instead, I believe a much better investing strategy is to buy high quality companies and invest in them when there's a good margin of safety. For example, I will buy more Apple, Microsoft, Alphabet, Visa, Mastercard, and American Express shares when they're at least 10% below their interest in values. Generally speaking, you want a larger margin of safety for stocks and investments that have high risk. Now, all these are only my opinions and my analysis based on my research. They are not financial wise. There are always risks associated with investing. You will need to do your own research and do your extra due diligence first before investing in anything. Thank you for watching this video and supporting our channel. This is Victor from the Intelligent Investor channel and I will see you in the next video.